y llynau gwerddion llonydd a gysgant mewn gwasgod o fynydd. A thyn heilwen y splenydd ar len y dŵr, lyn y dydd. From the round tower of Dolbadarn Castle 700 years ago, David, Prince of Wales, looked out at the besieging campfires of an invading army. Today, the ghosts of the Welsh princes from their ruined strongholds watch over friendly tourists who are attracted to the corner of Wales around Mount Snowdon that we call Snowdonia, a countryside of high mountains and deep valleys, of rushing streams, sunlit waterfalls and driving drenching rain. For it's the climate of Wales which has helped to mould the rocks of Snowdonia into the beautiful and rugged landscape of the present day. Imagine North Wales 540 million years ago. The climate was very warm because Wales lay near to where South Africa is today. It was part of a large landmass and attached not only to England, but to Southern Ireland and Northern Europe as well. You may not have needed an umbrella to live here, but you'd still get wet. A deep ocean separated the Welsh continent from another one, consisting of Scotland, Northern Ireland and North America. Periodically seas flooded the land, depositing thick layers of sands and muds. Over time, thousands of feet of sediment built up and was consolidated by pressure into sandstone and mudstone rocks. Into the mudstones, volcanoes of a later age injected veins of copper and gold. Some of the mudstone was metamorphosed into slate which outcrops around Bethesda and Llanberis. After the tides of 50 million years washed over the land, the two continents began to move towards each other. In their battle for dominance, submarine volcanoes and volcanic islands were thrown up into the narrowing ocean. Many of Snowdonia's highest mountains are made of rocks from this explosive age. But none were ever volcanoes themselves. The summit of Snowdon is a mixture of muds and volcanic dust originally laid down on the sea floor, then later uplifted. Nearby, cooled ash sheets and lava flows form the rock face of Llywedd, and volcanic magma line the cliffs of Crib Adiskil and Crib Goch. Many years passed, and the ocean disappeared as the two continents collided. The resulting stresses crumpled the earth for miles, buckling lavas at Cumidwell and arching the sandstones of Harlech. The earth moved up, down, even sideways, chipping out the valleys of Bala and Talathin. Lazily, Wales drifted northwards, passed over the equator and became part of one immense continent called Pangaea. Eventually, Pangaea broke up and left a Britain still joined to Europe. Five million years before the present, Britain gently tipped up, dipping England into the sea and raising the rocks of Wales. Rivers cut deeply into these highland plains, carving out V-shaped valleys. The ice ages came and went over two million years. Neanderthal man walked into Britain with a warmer weather and walked out again in cooler times. Glaciers spilt over the combs of Nant Francon and the Gludars 
and flowed away down the valleys. 8,000 years BC and it became much warmer. The ice melted and sea levels rose, cutting off Britain from Europe and widening into a sea the narrow strait between Wales and Ireland. Behind it, the ice left a trail of memories. Erratic rocks perched dangerously on top of one another and broad, deep, U-shaped valleys. Rain fell and lakes formed in these valleys and combs. Some are deep. It's 190 feet to the bottom of Llynlladel. On the mountainsides, Stone Age man hunted deer, ox and wild boar through a thick canopy of trees. By 4000 BC, the first farmers arrived from Europe, bringing with them livestock and grain. The new Stone Age men cleared the forests in order to graze their animals and grow crops. These people made tools out of stone or bone, and they built cromlechs, like the one at Capel Garmon, in which to bury their dead. On the coast at Penman Maur, they established a centre for making stone axes and traded their goods throughout Britain. 2,000 years later, the community at Penman Maur used bronze knives to sacrifice its children. The bodies were cremated and their ashes placed in urns, which were then buried beneath the standing stones of the Druid Circle. Druids themselves didn't actually enter the magic circle till 600 BC, when the influence of the Celts from Europe was paramount. These highly cultured people introduced to Britain the Brythonic language, together with a love of music, spoken poetry and storytelling. Very little was written down, and a love of battle. In the uplands, the raven, shape-shifter and goddess of battle soared over the hilltop forts in which these tribes lived in times of war. At Penagair, this hill fort dominated the river Conway below. The men dug in rows of small jagged stones to upend enemy horse riders. The Celts knew how to make strong weapons and chariots out of iron as well as beautiful objects from bronze, silver and gold. Sometimes these articles were cast into lakes as offerings to the water spirits. For the Celts, all natural phenomena, from stones and lakes to trees and birds, were sources of divine power. Dressed in white robes and armed with yew wands, their religious leaders, the Druids, conducted human sacrifices in sacred oak groves. <laughs> 